scripture reading comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. I know the greatest gift you ever received for Christmas was Emmanuel, God with us. But would you just take, we're just going to take a quick minute. Would you turn to somebody close to you or a family member who you've got around you? Would you quickly share what was the greatest gift that you remember getting for Christmas? Either as a child or as an adult. Would you just take a quick moment? Go ahead and turn to your neighbor. You don't have to be quiet. You don't have to whisper. What was the, one of the greatest gifts you ever got for Christmas? Go ahead. Well, I don't know exactly what is your greatest, greatest gift, but I hope that brings you joy, the memory of that. And I think a lot of us during this season, we sometimes think about some of those things that we've anticipated. And as we've been talking about this gift and the uh, preparation for the greatest gift, which is behind me here, and he's no longer hanging on it, which I'm thankful for, that he not only really died, but he rose from the grave and defeated sin so we might receive the gift of grace. And that's a, a great reminder for us, even during Advent, we're not in Lent, uh, uh, but we're preparing for all these things and rem being reminded about how much God has blessed us already. And sometimes during the season, we, we lose sight of that. But uh, when we think about this gift and the anticipation of it, uh, I don't know about you, but I, I wonder... When you received your greatest Christmas gift that you just shared, if the excitement was heightened when it was sitting in your lap, or was it the moment when you got the peek inside of it? Are those two, really two separate occasions even? Or maybe in our anticipation of opening the present, maybe that's one of the greatest gifts and that maybe it wasn't exactly what was inside of it, but it was just the excitement of knowing what was under the tree or what was going to be uh, put in my lap here in a few moments. Or maybe for you it was true the moment where you opened the box and peeked inside and you saw exactly what it was that was going to bring you great joy. However, maybe the glimpse of the actual gift and the anticipation caused you to plummet instead of being heightened in joy. I don't know about you, but all families have little separate traditions on how you do things. When we sing happy birthday in our house, I frequently we'll say cha-cha-cha or, you know, ask somebody to stand up and do the hula on a chair. Or, I don't, or another one of my family groups, when they sing happy birthday, they do not sing it on key at all. So everyone can participate. And so they sing at different keys and different speeds and clap. And it's just terrible. It, it sounds horrible, honestly. <laughs> but when you get ready for your, your holiday, my holiday experiences, I have two brothers with Down syndrome. So they will eternally have the maturity of about a 12-year-old. And uh, because of that, when we open presents, my youngest brother, Micah, when he gets the chance to see somebody open a present, and they're about ready to open it up and peek inside with great anticipation, he yells out, underwear! <laughs> oh, rats, you got underwear. Some of you may be sitting there thinking, I could use some new underwear. 
I'd welcome a gift like that. Will that bring you joy, though? Well, depends on your underwear situation, and I'm not going to preach on that anymore this morning. Maybe you might say, oh my gosh, this is the perfect gift I've received with excitement as you open your present that's not underwear. But if my brother Mike or Joel there, they will shout underwear as you open your box. The anticipation of this picture-perfect gift for some of us is sometimes robbed because we have a heightened expectation in our heart that maybe, maybe in the box I'm going to find what I really want. Maybe it is going to be finally the Red Rider BB gun. Or maybe it's going to be the Jelly of the Month Club, the gift that keeps on giving. The emptiness and sadness is sometimes replaced with the anticipation of opening another present. The perfect gift might be inside of it. Or sort of like Christmas, we believe that we should have had something and maybe we're anticipating, well, I'll get what I wanted anyway later on. But I really wanted fill in the blank. I really wanted this. Some of us have that kind of blue feeling after all the presents have been opened and all the, all the tissue paper has been collected and put in recycling or in the trash as well. I really wanted blank. I really wanted fill in the blank, but I didn't get it. But I had the joy of watching other people receive the gifts that I had to give and I got new underwear that I need to wash before I wear or whatever your Christmas experience was. I think it's unusual when we watch TVs and movies about these Christmas experiences. Maybe you're into the Hallmark movies, or maybe you're just into the classics like Die Hard or Elf or uh, whatever your Christmas favorite is. But while you're watching some of those on TV, you may see the commercials. And the commercials crack me up. My favorite commercials are the ones where people get the luxury automobiles. And there's music playing. And somebody walks out into the driveway, and there's the luxury mobile. There's no, uh, there's no, uh, what's that called? Snow, right? There's no snow in the driveway, but there's snow all over the grass, right? And it's picture perfect. Him and her walk out. Their makeup and hair looks wonderful. Like, like it, it's going to be like that on Christmas morning early on, right? And my question for those people is, who makes the financial decision without their other loved one to spend forty, sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars to get a luxury mobile? Surprise! Here's your new car. We're in debt forever. <laughs> you bought what? I'm so excited. We're going to be eating ramen noodle forever. Here's another truth bomb for us. That even though it might have been a few days in your life, or maybe you've been going through some of the expectations of preparing for Christmas, we, sometimes we get wrapped up in those pieces, and we need to be reminded about what is the ultimate gift, or what is it we're going to give and receive. I think for Joseph, he wasn't getting ready to prepare for, for Christmas necessarily, but he was preparing for the birth of his son, but it wasn't the story or the gift that he was expecting. Today's scripture of Mary and Joseph, God's work upsets the expectation, the, the comfortable social expectation and convention that we have for Joseph, the unsung hero of the New Testament, that we really don't spend a whole lot of time talking about Joey and Joseph, what he had to do for us. But the first Christmas did not get lived out as a flawless preparation and execution, at least dictated by expectation we might have. It was quite unexpected. And we know from the Bible that when the God or an angel appears, number one, we should take this very seriously and do whatever they're told or whatever we're told. I've never had God or an angel appear for me, but odd things could happen. And number two, it's not going to follow the plan that we probably had in our mind. As a result, see rule number one, we should take very seriously and do whatever we're told because God has a story for us it's going to turn out even better than we might have expected. There will be challenges, as there's challenges in all of our lives as well. And we, so we should have an expectation of that. So as we peek into the story of our life, we should have an expectation that there will be some challenges. There will be some things that are little bumps in the roads or absolutely catastrophes that we have to navigate that God will walk alongside of us as well. We sometimes forget that the scandal of the incarnation and the virgin birth was for Joseph and for Mary and for their families and for their entire community as well. That underneath all the wrapping and all the pretty nativity scenes lies both a wonder and a scandal. 
Frequently, I hear somebody say, well, that's not very Jesus-like, or it's not very church-like. And I, I usually snicker when I hear somebody say that, because when I think about things being very Jesus-like, I think about the story of Jesus, his birth, and how, well, it was scandalous. And his life was scandalous. And the things he said was scandalous. And the death that he experienced was scandalous. And the fact that he conquered sin and death for us was scandalous. And so when people say, that's not very Jesus-like, I go, well, I don't know if you know much about my Savior, but he did some pretty incredible things. And they weren't just prototypical. We sometimes play the game as a church about our facade about their, how we present ourselves to people. But I got stuff, and you got stuff, and all God's children got stuff. And as a result, we need a Savior. We needed the birth of Jesus Christ. Even though he was born to a mother, a scandalous mother and a father. So in many people's minds, Jesus wasn't very Jesus-like, or his original story. It's more likely that Jesus' mommy and daddy were not called very Jesus-like names. Had you thought about that context before? Or that Jesus was probably not called very godly names as well. Huh. There's a bitterness that we sometimes welcome in the disappointment of gifts. But if you're honest with yourself, isn't that your own experience as well? That when things fail to live up to the notion of perfect, aren't those the times when we find ourselves more graced and more faithful than otherwise we might have experienced. Opportunities to step out on faith. God provides those for us. Sometimes we fear them because it may change us or may change our situation. And I've worked really hard to work this goal and situation in my life. And if I let Jesus into the room, he may change all my plans. But it's going to be for the better, right? If I open this present, I peek into it, it's going to be for the better. Today's sneak peek into the story of this first Christmas assures us that unexpected things, things outside of the conventional, can often be wonderful signs that God is at work. When we see God at work, sometimes we look at it and go like, I wouldn't have picked it that way. But now that I see the direction from A to B to whatever letter this is and whatever letter that is, I can see that God's fingerprints were involved in this situation. I wouldn't have picked this path. But because I can see this path, I can celebrate that God has done a beautiful thing. And maybe you could testify about that in your life as well, that you might say, well, this, this, I mean, this, I wouldn't have, God moves in mysterious ways, right? Because of that, we sometimes, we live in this less than perfect Christmas experience for us because we have a heightened ex expectation about how it's supposed to be. I mean, I know we're time we're going to wake up and what time we're going to open presents, we're going to eat, and somebody's going to come from out of town. And I know, sometimes I'm aware that it's not going to turn out just that way, though. But for Joseph, somehow Joey had to trust the strange news that he received from the angel to boldly violate conventional wisdom to remain faithful to Mary. Because God, as God often does, intervened in an unexpected way. A way that maybe we didn't anticipate. Maybe we didn't have the expectation I was going to peek in and find exactly what God had in store for me. And can you imagine how uncertain Joseph's future might have felt for him and for his family as well? Because this was an entire family system and network as well. Mary? Pregnant? What are people going to think or say? Or I'm sure they said a whole lot. She disappeared and went and hung out with her cousin Elizabeth and came back and here she is pregnant. And then Joseph listens to an angel telling him not to be afraid. Okay. All right. Don't be afraid. Take Mary as his wife still. So he changes his plans, and he doesn't dismiss her, but instead he continues with what he had planned initially. Have you ever thought about the context of the story from Joseph's perspective? Let me drop some truth bombs on you about Joseph. Some consideration. Now, this is not all fleshed out in the gospel for us to read directly, but we can fill in some of the blanks. We can, we can assume some pieces about the culture. We can know that there are some stereotypes that we can live into as well about this story. 
But let's consider a couple details. Number one, we don't have an idea how old Joseph is. He could have been the same age as Mary. Not likely. Probably older. This could have possibly been his second marriage. Maybe his first wife has passed away and he took Mary as a second wife. We don't know, but when we put little kids in pageant clothes, we normally put two similar age kids together, right? Otherwise, it gets uncomfortable, right? We do that intentionally. And sometimes we grow up that story not thinking about the context of what that might mean. So we, we will assume that Joseph is old enough to make adult decisions, to pay taxes, to already have a career. He's probably already built onto his father's home in preparation for Mary to come and live and be a part of his, his relationship with him. And so we don't, we don't know how old Joseph was. We just, maybe you want to assume in your mind, that's okay. But Joseph and, and Mary, they were not married yet, and they were not truly engaged. It was actually a step above engagement. They were betrothed. And so the idea in this customary of the Jewish household is that two people would, uh, uh, their families would arrange for them to be in marriage together, and maybe it was somebody within the community they knew or had grown up with. But inevitably, the families would introduce each other, and they would make a covenant vow that they were going to uh, continue to be in a married relationship a year from now. And so it's like they're engaged plus. And they, they're not living together, but they would act as husband and wife from that day forward. And so Mary and Joseph, they had already been calling each other husband and wife before the birth of Jesus, in anticipation of them having a union together physically, for them that, that marriage to be consummated. And so there's already this heightened expectation. So when we read scripture about how Joseph was maybe thinking quietly about divorcing her, well, they weren't married yet. They kind of were in this culture. They kind of already were husband and wife. They had just not had the completed part of this presentation. And so there's more at stake for Joseph in this relationship with Mary because he's already referring to her as his wife. And now she's shown up and she's pregnant. What's the rest of the community going to think? Joseph is a righteous man. In verse 19 in our scripture we did this morning in the NIV, it's changed over time. The new NIV that we have uh, says that he was a follower of the law. Does that mean that Joseph just followed the 613 laws in the Old Testament and he didn't have a relationship with God? No. There are other translations that refer to Joseph as a righteous man, that he had a righteous relationship with God. So yes, he did follow the 613 laws of the Old Testament, but he had a relationship with God as well. That's when God is chastising the Pharisees and Sadducees about what they're doing wrong. Frequently, they're following the law, but they have no relationship with God. Joseph is a man of God. He knows the law. He knows what's at stake now that Mary has shown up pregnant. And so Joseph was a righteous man. He followed the law, but he also had this relationship with God. And he could have had her stoned or murdered. Well, since the Romans have taken over the area, they, they weren't really executing the stoning as frequently as they had previously in the Old Testament. And Joseph didn't want to hurt the woman that he still had care and feelings for. It's not like she was a stranger to him. He probably spent many evenings in her presence, meals and working together and going for walks or whatever they did as a couple in preparation for their union together. He wouldn't want to have seen her murdered. He already had a heart of God. Now, we didn't know necessarily from the beginning, but we know now that Joseph had the reassurance from God's angel about what this gift was going to be. That it was going to be the gift of Emmanuel, God with us. But prior to that, Joseph didn't know that his pregnant wife, maybe she had, uh, well, maybe somebody had forced themselves upon her. Or maybe she had lost her courage and given herself to another. All these questions would have been things that Joseph would have wrestled with, just as we might have as well in that situation. It's easy for us to step back, and so Joseph had this all figured out, clearly. But he had some wrestling to do, and God spoke to him in righteous ways. He made the difficult decision, ultimately. Even though the angel spoke to him about what he should do, he still followed through with it because he had faith. He had taken a peek inside this gift and saw what God had in store for him. It may not have been exactly what he had intended. Maybe he thought he was getting underwear, but instead, 
he got the best gift he could ever, ever receive. And he celebrated it. He celebrated it to such a degree that he took care of Mary, that he took on the shame. Inevitably, everyone, his family, the entire community, knew that he was staying in a relationship with Mary, and that's either acknowledging that Mary had his baby, or it was another and he was willing to be the father of it. Either way, that's a courageous gift. He made the difficult decision. He did the hard work, and he claimed her. He took her to his hometown as well when she was pregnant. He could have left her home with family and said, oh, we've not consummated the relationship yet, so it's not finalized. I don't have to take her with me to Bethlehem, my hometown. But he did. He did because he loved her. And he loved what God had done in and through her. Think about that context this season as well. When we think about the entire story, frequently we jump over Joseph's story. We don't think about Joey and we move right to Mary and Jesus and the... Who else is there? We got the wise guys who show up a couple months later or years later, but we have these... Well, we prepare for... All these people, they're going to come, including those who care for the, the animals out in the fields, the shepherds, as they came as part of the story as well. People were shaking their heads in disbelief of all of this. And the shepherds and these wise guys, they didn't know all this story, but we know it because we can read the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the good news. What is Joseph thinking? That's probably what a lot of people thought as he opened that gift and he received it and celebrated it. Maybe Joseph shook his head a little bit in disbelief from time to time too, because life can be difficult. But even though Joseph faced a future that was uncertain, he trusted God to be faithful. And we too can trust God's promise and God's presence. When we too take a peek into the ultimate gift, we hear the voice of God's messenger say, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid of the cold or the dark or the mystery. Embrace what God has to give you. When we let God work in our lives, we have the opportunity to live into the fullness of God's promise. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, when we sometimes lose sight about all the beautiful things that we have in our lives, we are reminded about the story of your son Jesus and how unlikely of a story that is. We celebrate it this morning. We give thanks that you've already moved in our lives, that you continue to give us a present of your presence. Help us to keep the focus on that. And as we read these stories, may we be reminded of the story that you have already put in our lives of our relationship with Jesus. That we have the responsibility of sharing the story with others. And sometimes we just don't feel the courage to do so but we already know that you have already walked with us and walked with us through difficult times. Continue to make your Holy Spirit present to us that we might share your story to others who desperately need to hear it, who are stuck and cold in darkness. We want to share that light. It's your name we pray.